Happy, happy Sabbath. Sabbath. We are glad to be here. Good morning and happy Sabbath. We praise and thank the Lord for another Sabbath that comes to our lives. And we are so thankful that you are here with us to join us in this worship this morning. From our family, we would like to say happy Sabbath to each and every one of you. May we receive the blessings that the Lord has provided for us this beautiful Sabbath day. Once again, happy Sabbath. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Before we get into our announcements, we want to give a special thank you to all our veterans for their service to our country and to their families and our church. We love you all so much and God bless. Now on to the announcements. Don't forget to keep social distancing six feet apart. And if you do go out, don't forget your cute mask. We want to thank everyone for their faithfulness through their tithes and offerings to the El Paso Central SDA Church. Thus far, our church budget is $4,781.10 and our building fund is $1,488. Thank you so much, everyone. Parents, don't forget to send your child's name and your phone number to their Sabbath school teacher so that they can be included in the online service. If you've been shopping online during quarantine, why not help EPAJA while doing it? Go to smile.amazon.com to help out. There will be a men's ministry meeting on November 15th. For more information, contact Brian Canales. If you feel that the Lord has blessed you with the gift of storytelling, please don't forget to contact Jason Cushion to help out the audio and visual team. We are holding Wednesday night prayer meetings on Zoom at 7. Please contact Ms. Prosper Lewanik for the code. The date to drop off your tithes and offerings at the church will be November 16th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. If you've moved or your phone number has changed, please contact Ms. Prosper Lewanik so she can update your information. Board members, there will be a meeting today at sundown. Please look out for the code sent by Ms. Prosper. That's all for announcements this week. Once again, we want to wish a special blessing to all our veterans and their families. Have a happy Sabbath, everyone. Thirty years ago, the Seventh-day Adventist Church embarked on a bold new mission focus that would totally change the face of the church. Church leaders identified key areas where the mission was struggling. Although the church was growing rapidly in certain parts of the world, many areas and people groups remained totally unreached. The church would continue working in areas where it was doing well. But something needed to change if we were to be faithful to the Great Commission to go to all peoples. At the General Conference session in 1990, delegates voted the Global Strategy document and Global Mission became an urgent new mission focus. There were two key objectives. One, to alert church members to the large number of unreached people groups and two, to plant new groups of believers among those groups. Since 1990, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has nearly quadrupled in size. Millions of new believers have found life in Jesus and have joined the Adventist family. They've come from new territories, new people groups, different cultures. They've brought joy to heaven and strength to God's church. We praise God for the thousands of new groups of believers that have been planted. And yet, we're still here. Mothers still sit and beg beside busy city streets. Many still wake each morning in fear of the spirit world. Millions in the 1040 window have never even heard of the name Jesus. Only one third of the people on earth are Christian. Two thirds follow other world religions. And a growing number claim no religion at all. And still there are cities of more than one million people with no recorded visit by even one Seventh-day Adventist. We so long for Jesus to come. That's why Global Mission continues to focus on unreached people in the 1040 window, the cities, in the secular postmodern West. Global Mission sends out thousands of Global Mission pioneers to start new groups of believers among the unreached. That's why it supports tent makers in the world's most challenging regions. 
And that's why Global Mission is helping to start hundreds of urban centers of influence in cities across the globe. Today, six Global Mission centers focus on the most effective ways to share the good news with people from non-Christian backgrounds. These centers find the best ways to build bridges of understanding and help field test resource materials, methods and models. Their goal is to remove barriers that make it difficult for people to understand and accept the gospel. We praise God for the millions who have found hope and peace in Jesus since Global Mission began. But we need more Global Mission pioneers. We need more urban centers of influence. And we need more prayer. Thirty years ago, Adventist church leaders cast a bold vision for mission. That vision still burns strong. To reach unreached people, to reach teeming cities, to reach those who feel no need of religion. Today, we still need people to answer the call to mission, to reach the unreached with hope, to share the good news about Jesus. We need people who will answer the call that still echoes after 30 years. We need people who will say, I will go. My experience in the area of agriculture in EPHA has been a blessing. I have learned one way 
we can interact with God and His creation. Preparing the soil has been a big challenge. We encountered a lot of obstacles. There was a lot of weeds and bad plants and big rocks that could damage the, the tractor implant. I'm amazed at how seed is dry inside and outside that can germinate and come to life. We can see this as a miracle of God with our own eyes. Good morning, church. Sing with us hymn number 612, Onward Christian Soldiers. Onward Christian Soldiers, marching us to Sabbath Church family. I hope everyone's doing well. Um, I pray that everyone is keeping safe and uh, taking this virus seriously. You know, we're living in true prophetic times. You know, not only uh, are we seeing a, a, a virus or a pestilence that is ravaging our planet uh, and our city. As a matter of fact, I read somewhere that one out of 
30 people in El Paso have been infected with COVID-19. But uh, we're not only seeing the virus, we've seen fires, we're seeing civil unrest, politics that's just uh, scary to look at, right? Where uh, we just have so much uncertainty in the world today. But uh, take heart because God is always with us and he'll always be with us uh, even until the end of the age. And that's a promise that we have. So let us keep our eyes on Jesus. Let us focus on his promises. And um, may the peace of God abound in your family. And, uh, and I hope everyone's doing well. Let us have a word of prayer. Uh, bow our heads and let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful Sabbath day and for all the blessings that you bestow upon us, everything that you do for us, Father. We know that we are living in difficult times, uncertain times, and uh, we know that we should expect these things. We've known for many years, Father, that we were to see a lot of the things that we're starting to see. And we shouldn't be alarmed. We shouldn't be fearful of the future because all this points to is the glorious return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's all that this is pointing to. And many will run to and fro, fearful, confused, worried. But let us have the peace that only is found in your Son, Jesus Christ. May the Holy Spirit be sent to each and every single one of us, Father. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Empty us of self. Empty us of, of all the negative things, Father, that are found in this world. And fill us with your love, your spirit, your peace. And may you protect each and every single one of us. Take care of your church, Lord. Take care of those that are fragile. Be with those that are sick. Be with them, Father. Don't forget about us. Stay with each and every single one of us, our parents, our siblings, our children especially, Father. But, uh, but I pray for those who are older or fragile. Be with them, Father, and protect them. Keep them safe from this virus, Father of Heaven. I pray forgiveness of our, our, the forgiveness of our sins, Father. Please forgive us our offenses against you and against, and against each other. May you take those sins, Father, and take them and bury them in the deepest part of the ocean. May they never be brought up again because that's what you've promised. Thank you, Lord, for sending your only son, Jesus, for sending our Lord and Savior so that his righteousness can be seen in us. We are sinners, we know this. We fail, we sin, we... There's so many flaws in us, Father. But our Lord and Savior, Jesus, that's who you see in us. When we believe in your only Son, when we seek Him and, and, and find Him, when we believe in Him, and when we love Him and worship Him, you cover us with his righteousness, and that's what you see in each one of us. And we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for that. Be with us, Lord. Please protect us, watch over us, and uh, never depart from us, Father. We thank you, Lord, again, for everything you do for us. And we ask this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. God bless you.
Happy Sabbath everyone, Auntie Jackie here with another children's story, so let's jump right in. I have here with me two eggs. Let's first look at some of the similarities. They're both the same size and they're both oval shaped. And now let's take a look at some of the differences. Well, one is brown and one is white. So now let's give it a crack and take a look at what's inside. And we'll give it a little swirl, being careful not to disturb the egg. Okay, great. So let's take a closer look. We've got some albumin here, which is the clear part of the egg, and the yolk, which is the yellow part. Based on what we can see here, can any of you tell me which egg came from the white shell and which came from the brown shell? As you saw from this little egg experiment, both eggs were the same inside, even though they had different colored shells on the outside. So what can we learn from this little demonstration? It doesn't matter what color my skin is on the outside because on the inside, we're all the same. We have blood, bones, a heart, stomach, and other organs. We shouldn't treat people differently based on the color of their skin. Each person should be afforded the same opportunities, dignity, and respect as the next person regardless of their skin tone. Friends, there is a lot going on in this world right now. We're in the middle of a global pandemic and in the midst of that, we have a global racial uprising. Our brothers and sisters are hurting, frustrated, and fighting for social justice, and we need to do our part. I know you might feel like you're too little or too young to do anything because this issue seems so big, but you can start at home and at school. Ask your parents, your teachers, and your pastors questions. Read the Bible and other good books, or watch videos that explain why these sad things happen. We can all lead by example and demand that all people be treated equally and fairly. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, Paul says, Let us do good to all people. Let's also do as Jesus instructed in John chapter 15, verse 17. Love one another as I have loved you. May the Lord our God give us hope and strength. I love you all. Have a blessed Sabbath, everyone. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for the Sabbath day and thank you for blessing us all. I pray that you continue to bless us and help us to be more like you. I pray in a special way for the people who are in need. Please help the people who are sick and bless them with your healing hands. And please be with the people who are hurting. Please help us stay together as a church family and help us to love one another. We pray all of this in your name. Amen. Thank you for listening. See you next time. Our scripture for today is taken from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life, for then they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. Good morning, Church. Before I introduce to you our speaker, let me first give you an update regarding our church reopening. With the continued spike of COVID-19 cases in our community, we will include in the church board agenda tonight as to when and how are we going to reopen our in-person services. We will keep you posted of whatever the board decides. Thank you for your patience. Today is our veteran Sabbath, acknowledging the work of our veterans and active duty men and women in uniform. However, we also would like to recognize our other workers on the front line of this pandemic crisis. 
So this Sabbath, we would like to express our deep appreciation for their dedication and commitment to their calling. We would like you to know how grateful we are as a community for all your hard work. And we are keeping you all in prayers. Our speaker this morning is Pastor Jonathan Gonzalez. He is a district pastor of four churches and a group here in our Texaco Conference. Together with his wife Odile Eunice and son Nathan Andres. He was in active duty for eight years and now a chaplain in the Army Reserves. He has been in the Army Reserves for 10 years. He enjoys the outdoors, weightlifting, playing tennis, but above all, studying prophecy and preaching the gospel. Today, he will bring a message for our veterans and church members alike. But before he breaks to us God's message, let us share with you a video in honor of our veterans, active duty and frontline workers. Deep and 
inside our hearts there is still a war that wages that makes the sacrifice so hard to see as midnight fell on crucifixion day the light of hope seemed all so far away as evil tried to block redemption's flow mercy said no I'm not gonna let you go I'm not gonna let you slip away you don't have to be afraid mercy said no sin will never take control life and death stood face to face as darkness tried to steal my heart away thank you Jesus Mercy said no, and now in heaven looks at me, it's through the blood of Jesus, reminding me of one day long ago, long ago. Good afternoon. Uh, happy Sabbath. Let us open our Bibles in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 3 to 4, and then we jump to verse 8 to 10. The word God says, You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a sword. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffered trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore I endure all these for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal Lord, we read the Bible in Philemon chapter 1 verse 2, the Bible says, To Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, to the beloved Apaya, our keepers, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Philippians 2 25 reads, Yet I consider it necessary to send to you the Baphroditas, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one whom minister to my need. Now here Paul is referring to himself, to Timothy, and to others as soldiers. And by extension, he is referring to you and to me as fellow soldiers as well. From this, we then must realize that you are a, when you are a follower of God, you are in battle. You're in the battlefield. My question then is, how many of us live with that reality in mind. Now, there is a song that I usually sing with my son in Spanish, it goes like this. 
Soldado soy de Jesús, soldado soy de Jesús, aunque no marchen la infantería, la artillería, caballería. And in, in English, it goes something like this. I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot in the artillery. I may never fly over land and sea, but I'm the Lord's. I'm, I'm in the Lord's army. Now this song is true, but how many of us then live as soldiers? My son, already at the tender age of three, he understands that he's a soldier in God's army. But how many of us understand that reality? Now today, as we uh, are honoring our veterans, and celebrating Veterans Day, we will talk about the sacrifice of veterans, sacrifice of soldiers, and apply some principles from their experiences to our Christian life. And as we pay honor to these brave men and women in uniform, let us then learn from them. Now, American soldiers are engaged in battle for one main reason, and that main reason, the principle above all others is freedom. Freedom. Freedom in America, freedom in the world, freedom overall. While in America, the excellently well-framed Constitution grants us our freedoms, it is the veteran who has fought time and time again to keep this rise in the face of opposition, both locally and abroad. It is the veteran who fought the British to grant this freedom self-government, no taxation without representation, uh, something that these days the removal of the Electoral College will certainly do for most of Americans in the small states and cities, which is to remove their representation for all intended purposes. Now, it is the veteran who fought to abolish slavery and grant the freedom to our African-American brethren. Freedom to self-determination outside of the plantations. Yes, of crops and thought. It was the veteran who fought the Nazis to grant freedom from the false idea of the superiority of any race. It was the veteran who fought in many fronts, like Korea and other Asian, Asian and European nations, to keep economic freedom. But beyond that freedom from communism, beyond that, he fought to keep freedom as a whole, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of self-determination, something that has no place in these communist regimes. And time and time again, it was veterans, it is veterans who fight to preserve the American way of life. But what about us as Christians? Are we uh, merely citizens of the heavenly kingdom? Or are we actively engaged in spiritual warfare? Now the text here says in verse 4, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. My question for you is, how are you faring in the light of these words? Jesus called you, he enlisted you in his army, but is he currently saying of you, well done my faithful servants? Or on the other hand, is he saying, why do you call me Lord and Lord, 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 and do not do the things that I say? In the military, you're told what to do. That is why the military life is not good for everyone. When in training, you're told when to wake up and when to go to sleep, when to eat, and what to wear, and so forth. <laughs> Even outside of training, that training environment, you are told how much you must wait, how you need to perform, what uniform you need to wear, and at what time, and when to move from one place to the next without much time in advance. Now, Jesus also has asked us very clearly certain things that we must do. He has told us very clearly, Beat the poor, visit the prisoner, clothe he who does not have any clothing. Be kind to the homeless, do charity to the needy. Be like the good Samaritan, 
and so forth. But beyond that, we're even told to be joyful, to have an attitude of gratitude, to pray for your enemies, to keep these commandments, and to share the good news. Now, all of this requires some form of sacrifice, be it in the form of time, be it in the form of resources, be it in the form of coming out of your comfort zone, out of your own little, little world. In Romans chapter 8, verse 37, Paul again uses that terminology related to the battlefield. He says, as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as cheap to be slaughtered. But then he says, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Yet, I ask again, how many of us are willing, as our veterans have, to put our life on the line for the sake of the gospel? Because, brethren, let me tell you, soldiers don't quit in the battlefield. If you quit and you're in the battlefield, that means death. We are in a battlefield, and the enemy is on the attack. We must not quit. Veterans didn't give up. Some even died in the line of duty. Some returned after having accomplished the mission. No matter what you're going through in life, you must not give up. And much less when you have that precious promise that says, we're more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Yes, my brother, yes, my fellow veteran, we are more than conquerors through Christ our Lord. Now, do we not all love the stories of those who endure, those stories of soldiers that do not give up, that always persevere until the end? What do we call them? Well, we call them heroes, right? And it comes to mind that story of Desmond Doss, that brave man who without a weapon saved the lives of hundreds of tens of soldiers. And it was around a hundred soldiers that he saved. And when we look at the scenes there, when he was facing the raging fire, when he was facing the enemy, when he was the only one, he was left alone all by himself on the mountain, accompanied only by the wounded. And yet he persevered all throughout the night with that famous phrase of his, so help me get one more, Lord. Help me get one more. And the promise and the fulfillment of that prayer also stands for you and for me. As long as we keep on fighting, as long as we keep on moving, God will be by our side. As he did with Desmond does, Yahweh has our back. Lord God Almighty has our back. Now pay attention to this. In the military, usually a veteran is someone that has served and now is no longer serving, or someone that has deployed and served in combat and now has returned. Which means, if we translate that to the spiritual realm, that there are no veterans in God's army as of yet, at least not alive, right? There are thousands, perhaps millions of veterans that gave their life in the past. Those who persevere until the end throughout the ages, throughout the history of the Christian church, those are the veterans. But alive right now, there are no veterans. All of us are but soldiers fighting in God's army. We must keep on fighting because the battle is not over. The war hasn't ceased. So the battle is still raging and we are not done with the mission. On the side, on this side of eternity, we still have a fight to wage. Now, I like that story. Have you ever seen that movie called American Sniper. It's a wonderful story. This sniper kept on going back and back until the mission was accomplished. He had an enemy to defeat and he did not give up until he was able to be successful in his mission. He kept on going back and going back until he was able to do so. That is how we must be spiritual. We must persist. We must not give up. If a brother is leaving, we must persist in prayer. Somebody is discouraged, we must persist in encouraging them. We must continue the good fight. 
Now, because the mission is not over, as good soldiers we must wear our armor. Suppose some soldiers leave their weapons in the room and then they report for duty in the battlefield. What would you say about those soldiers? And yet many Christians choose to go in and wage war against the enemy without their weapon. Not in their heart, not in their mind, and not in their possession. They don't have the Bible as part of that defense, offensive weapon that they have as the sword of the Spirit. Now, just as our veterans and soldiers, they have the right uniform in order to be successful, you and I must also wear, wear the appropriate uniform. And Paul also tells us which is this uniform. We read it in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. And keep on reading, but I'm just going to read verses 10 and 11. The Bible says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes, against the wiles of the enemy. This is we read in verse 4 of 2 Timothy chapter 2. We must please our commander. We must please the captain of our salvation. Now, in the armed forces, training is supremely important. Readiness is very important. If you want to do well in the army, you just must be at the right place at the right time, in the right uniform, with the right attitude. And if you want to go even beyond that, you must keep your weight and you must keep a good physical fitness performance. If you do excellent, actually, in those two areas, you will be on your commander's good side. Because you make some good goodies on the numbers. But not only that, it actually presents that he has a force that is ready for combat. They're ready to face the enemy. Now, in order for you to keep your weight and in order for you to do excellent in physical fitness, this means you have to do sacrifices. This means that it affects many things in your life. For example, you may not party as hard on the weekends, and much less when the physical fitness is coming, much less when you're going to combat. Or this may tell you not to eat certain things that you would want to eat. Or stay up as late as you, as you will want to stay. So, in order for you to do excellent in these two areas, you must sacrifice certain things that you will love. Now, Paul also encouraged Timothy, saying the following, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. Timothy, my son, I am giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by recalling them, you may fight the battle well. You may fight a good fight, holding on to the faith and a good conscience. Now, here we just heard that he will, and that is speaking about Timothy, he will fight the good fight as long as he keeps on the faith and as long as he keeps a good conscience. Now, my question for you is what does it take? for a Christian to keep a good conscience. How will your conscience be clear and you will be at peace with your mind, with yourself? Well, there's only one way to do so. And that is when all of your actions, when all of your thoughts, when your entire life is aligned with the biblical principles that you say you believe in. And is that an easy thing? Well, certainly it isn't. And it requires a complete submission of your life. For us today, having a good conscience will affect what we listen to, what we watch, what we speak, the places we visit, what we post online, and yes, even how we vote. It will affect our entire life if we live to please Jesus. Now remember, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he, might, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And my question is, who are you living to please? What are you living to please? Is it your appetite? What about poor pride and prestige? When I was in my undergrad in psychology, 
I did take some classes because I already have my inclination to go and study, be a pastor. And I took some pastoral classes. Over there, we were taught the three F's that will lead many pastors to failure. And those three F's are females, pain, and finances. And they're not much different from what leads people to success or failure in this life. Females, pain, and finances. And I will add to that one perhaps entertainment and addictions. Those are the major temptations that we can face as humans. Now, a good soldier knows his priorities and the priorities that the mission demands. He doesn't get entangled in vain affairs. Our soldiers, let me remind you, that they do our great sacrifices. All of our veterans, they have to leave their families during training and deployment. Sometimes half a year, sometimes 12 months, sometimes 18 months, depending on the branch of service that they are serving. When they leave, when they're ready to go on deployment, they have this transitioning process. During that process, they do medical, they do administrative, they check their finances, but they also have briefings for the family. At this time, all the family members, they come and they learn how to pass on those duties of the service member that's deploying onto them. If he used to do the finances of the home, if he used to do the backyard, if he used to do uh, maintenance for the vehicles, all these things will now have to be handled by, by someone else in the family. And therefore they receive the appropriate training for this. Because the soldier cannot do both tasks. He cannot be in the battlefield and be concerned for the affairs of his family here. He has to have that peace of mind that they will be taken care of so that he can fully engage in a mission. Now, imagine a platoon leader who tells his team leader, one of the squads, that they're getting ready to go on a mission. And the mission will speed, which means the start point time will be briefly, and, and they will speed in 30 minutes. Now, what if the team sergeant will tell me, well, that's fine, but I had an appointment with the internet company to fix the internet at home, and that is also going to be in about 30 minutes, and it's very difficult to get an appointment with them. Or what if a team, another team member will say, well, I had scheduled to play some games with some friends, and that's going to take place in 20 minutes from now. Or what if another one will say, well, I am taking college classes, so I cannot go on a mission. What do you think the platoon leader and the commander will feel about this? Will they be pleased with that response? How dare, how dare do we dare to give such responses to our Lord sometimes? We decide not to engage the enemy, we decide not to fight the good fight, but we decide to live for ourselves. Now, how long will an army with soldiers acting like this last in the battlefield? Certainly not very long. If you're involved in church affairs, if you're involved in church life, it's minimum, perhaps only limited to the attendance, I will say that you have been entangled by the world. Your entanglement with the world affairs is too much. If you're not using your spiritual gifts for the Lord, something has you entangled. Perhaps you're not realizing it, but the enemy, the wicked one, might have hit you with some fiery darts and you didn't even realize it. You didn't even wear the shield to protect yourself. Why? Because you were not wearing the armor and you didn't have a great shield of salvation, the helmet of salvation. Shield of your faith. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8 to 10, we read, Remember that Jesus Christ of the sin of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffered trouble as an evildoer. 
even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. It's a prisoner, but the gospel is unchained. Therefore, I endure all these for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Now we learn that good soldiers like Paul persevere, not only in training, but also through hardship. Our soldiers endure hardship all the time. Like I mentioned earlier, months at the time without their families. Months at the time without knowing what it's like to sleep in a comfortable mattress. Or what it's like to eat something different outside of the defect, like a facility. Or worse yet, taking a shower, but not with a shower, rather with a bottle. Or not using a toilet, something we take for granted, but using a, either an outhouse or digging their own hole to release themselves. Now, they, su they suffer also debilitating injuries. Some may end up bleeding with prosthetics. Some may give the ultimate gift, which is their own life. Our soldiers endure hardship, and this is a common thing that all soldiers have endured throughout history. Now think of a Roman soldier, those soldiers that Paul was referring to. They had to march miles with sandals. They have to be away from their family in military campaigns for two, three years at a time without having Skype or Facebook or Messenger or WhatsApp or any of those to communicate with their beloved family. These Roman soldiers endure through hardship. Now, my question is, if you're not, my statement is that is, if you're too comfortable, likely you're not employed. Likely you're not engaged in war. Likely you have stayed in the rear detachment. Likely you refuse to face the enemy. Soldiers at times are deprived of their own freedom. That is called a prisoner of war. Verse 3, Paul says that he is a prisoner for the gospel. Verse 9, he also addresses the same issue. And my question is, are you willing to sacrifice your, your freedom so that the gospel may move unhindered, unchained? How much are you willing to give? Veterans give us a good example. They're willing to sacrifice all these things and to endure such hardship in order to preserve, preserve freedom in the American way of life. Soldiers must be also knowledgeable, right? They must be knowledgeable in their fields. They might know it very well. They must also qualify with their weapons. Now listen to this. Paul also encourages Timothy. 2 Timothy 2.15, we read, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a warrior who does not need to be a chain, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now my question is, how able are you to wield the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, when facing trial, when facing an opponent? How able are you at wielding the sword of truth? Our army has gained many victories because the soldiers are trained and proficient in their military tasks and drills. How apt are you to share the word of God with someone? How ready are you to share your testimony with someone in a brief period of time? You must be able at any time. Now, there is another aspect that soldiers also must be aware of, and that is, they must keep the morale. And what helps for that? Well, discipline, unity, R and R as well, rest and recreation, recovery and recreation, or all all of these are necessary. Good training. Soldiers slightly bring down the morale. Foreign soldiers bring down the morale. Poor training brings down the morale. Gossip and inner fights brings down the morale. Verse 16 of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 to 17, actually, we read, 
remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of their hearers. Verse 16, but shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. Verse 17, and their message will spread like cancer. Verse 18, who have strayed astray concerning the truth? Verse 23, but avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. Brethren, it is bad enough when soldiers don't do what they're supposed to do, but it's even worse when they don't even show up. It is bad enough when Christians are not doing what they're supposed to do, when they're not using their spiritual gifts, but it's worse when they're even absent. In church gatherings. And that has obviously increased during this time of pandemic. Now, let me tell you not only to me, but to many, there is no more discouraging thing than lack of attendance in the church. For the church leaders, it is very, very discouraging. It brings the morale down. It brings the morale down when not everyone is carrying their weight in the church. It brings the morale down when we don't pull our weight, when we don't work together as a team, just as our, our veterans have done time and time again in order to achieve the victory. If we want to be victorious as Christians, we must pull together. Now, soldiers, this is my last point here, soldiers don't fight alone. We are part of a team. Just the soldiers are part of a greater cause, part of the big army, they're part of the armed forces, they're part of the allied forces. They fight to preserve good in the world. But they don't fight alone, they fight with their teammates. Sometimes they fight for God and country, sometimes they fight to keep their friend alive. We're all part of the team in the military. In the church, the closer aligned we are with the Holy, to the Holy Spirit and to God's will and to pleasing Him, the closer that we draw to one another. We must align ourselves with the Holy Spirit with whom we have been sealed. Here in verse 19, Paul says, Nevertheless, the solid foundation, solid foundation of God stands. Having this seal, the Lord knows those who are His, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord of Christ depart from iniquity. We are all joined together under one faith, one Lord, one Spirit. We must keep on moving. We have a mission to fulfill. Preach the gospel to all the world in this generation. That is our mission. We must be faithful soldiers of the Lord. Now our veterans, like I say, they have endured hardship. They have paid with their health, with their life. And today we are doing this message precisely to pay honors to them. They deserve it. the great sacrifice they do so that we can enjoy freedom. Let's not give up those freedoms so easily that they have fought for. Let's keep on meaning. They have fought for freedom of religion. Let's not cease meaning. Of course, with due diligence, with the necessary care that we must have given the circumstances. Now, I would like to close with the soldier's creed. Some of you may know it because you are veterans. Some of you may not know it. But this is a beautiful creed of unity and excellence. And we'll do well as Christians also to practice something like that. Now, it goes like this. I am an American soldier. I am a warrior and a member of a team. I serve the people of the United States and lead the army values. I will always place the mission first. I will never accept defeat. I will never quit. I will never leave a fallen corner. I'm disciplined, physically and mentally tough, trained and proficient in my warrior tasks and dreams. I am an expert and I am a professional. I stand ready to deploy, engage, and destroy the enemies of the United States of America in close combat. I am a guardian of freedom and the American way of life. I am an American soldier. Now, if a soldier, <laughs> I got a little excited there, if a soldier can say such convicting words 
How much a soldier in God's army? What is our prayer? What are we living for? What is our legacy going to be? Veterans have helped us to preserve freedom. As a Christian, we must help the world to find the freedom that can only be found in Jesus Christ. Let me close with prayer for all of our veterans and for all the soldiers in the Lord's heart. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you this Sabbath morning for the blessing to that you to be able to worship. We thank you because we fully understand and acknowledge that we are indeed enlisted in your army. Oh, as we say when we join the army, so help us God. We say today, or oh God, as we are in your army, so help us God. Help us to perform our duties with excellence. Not out of, not out of fear, but out of love. Out of love for him who saved us, for the captain of, of our salvation. Or God, we want to take this time also to pray for our veterans. Those that are struggling with a mental issues, those who are struggling with health issues, those who are struggling with adaptation issues, those who are struggling with relational issues. Oh God, we want to place them before you, that your grace may be may flow towards them, be it in the form of a follower of yours, showing tender care and love for them, be it in the form of great care by the systems in our nation, be it in the form of the preaching of the word. Or God, we pray for all of them and their families of those who have also given the ultimate sacrifice. We Lord God, we pray for all of our active duty soldiers and reserve component and National Guard and in all the branches. We pray, Lord God, for their families. We pray, Lord God, for their finances. We pray, Lord God, for their relationships. We pray, Lord God, for their dreams and aspirations. Lord God, please bestow abundant blessings upon them. But above all, bestow that blessing that they may know you as the one and only true Savior. That they may see the true light. That they may find the true freedom. The freedom beyond the freedom that they fight for. Freedom from sin. Freedom from death. The freedom to live eternally in your presence. In perfect, good knowledge of you, and in perfect love and peace. We ask all these things in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.